So your action is actually feeding that narrative. And that narrative is what is feeding the perception they have about you. So how do you do that? You do that by adequate preparation for every task that you are given, regardless of how skillful or or how knowledgeable you are in the organization. That is why my first point is very, very valid. That you need, I mean, second point, you need to learn very, very fast. So any task that you are given, put some thought into it. Do it to the best of your ability. If it's a meeting that you go, prepare so well. Ask questions, ask a ton of questions. With your colleagues, sometimes your boss, so that you are not going there as a, as a, Somebody who can't speak or as a, you know, somebody who who has a problem with their cognitive function, you're not going to go there like that. You're going to go there somebody who's, although you, you are not supposed to know, yet you know. If you are not supposed to know and yet you know, that places you in a great boat when it comes to employee or, or perception of other people around you. It's super critical. Manage that perception. Within that 30 day window, manage their perception. In this episode, I'm going to be addressing what you need to do within the first 30 days of embarking on any endeavor. First 30 days. Crucial. We call that the honeymoon period. It could be about the first 30 days of getting a new job. Or first 30 days on, on embarking on a, a new project, first 30 days uh, of, um, of, of getting a promotion into a new department, new um, level, that kind of thing. So first, how do you handle this honeymoon period? It's crucial. It could be a make or break for either your career or your business or any other endeavor that you are uh, working on. And that's what this is all about. So let's get started. The first thing you need to know is that for any organization, there is what I call the power players. These power players can be visible or invisible, and both of them are super important. You can't ignore any of them. The visible ones are the traditional ones that you and I know. So if it's work that you're working for somebody, and you know that the owner of the company wields so much power. So they have these are power, big power players. The, let's say, uh, the people um, occupying the C-suites, like the chief operating officer, the chief financial officer, the CC guys, right? They are very, very powerful people. Chief people officer, chief strategy officer. Um, if you are in the States, titles like executive vice president, senior vice president, even VPs, right? They have power. And even some senior directors <clears throat> have a lot of power. So your first job is to identify who the power players are. And also, as a subset, you also have to identify the indirect power players. And these especially are the gatekeepers. So the gatekeepers are traditionally, let's say, executive assistants. So executive assistants to the CEO, executive assistants to the um, chief director, senior vice president, all these, or, or company secretary, all these assistants, that are gatekeepers. Why? The reason why they are powerful is that they have access to power. You need to go through them to get to power. And those people are equally, if sometimes not more, they are equally as powerful as the, power, the big power brokers <clears throat> themselves. So you need to first of all position yourself that within the first 30 days, you are going to know who the power brokers in the organization are. Because Chances are your paths are going to cross them, and you don't want to be the one who will, who will cross them wrongly in the name of I didn't know. You don't want to do that. So you have to position yourself that you know all the key players that you can. And how can you do that? How you do that is that when you go out, ask questions, you know, your colleagues. When your colleagues are going out, let's say they're going to have lunch together, your department, they're going to have lunch together, and they start talking. Sometimes they see people, and they talk, They talk. oh, okay, you know, uh, maybe they, they, you are sitting there at a group, and then they see somebody coming, and you just, sometimes you may not say anything, just observe their conversation, right? You would know, you will quickly begin to put pieces together and know who is who within the organization, so that 
you'll be able to play your your cards very well so that you don't you don't mess up when you get in front of those people a case in point um i think when i worked at my travel in uh, in uk one of the it's a very funny thing that happened of i mean it was quite serendipitous basically is that um, the, my travel used to have um, like most companies do had them um, a cafeteria so they provided subsidized lunch for us so you pay something small and then you have decent lunch so we'd all go to the cafeteria and i remember um, maybe about a week or two in my first stint at um, my travel i was in the queue waiting to be served so you normally pick a, a plate and then you take it to where the the chef and the chef assistants will serve you and then after that, you go and, 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 and sit by your desk, I mean, the, the table, and then you eat with your colleagues. So I, I, it just happened to me just naturally, you know, so I was in the queue and I just picked mine. But something within me just said, it didn't feel right picking just mine. So I picked two bowls. It's not in the era of coronavirus. So there was nothing like that there. So I picked two bowls, and my just natural reflexes told me that just hand over the other one to the person behind me. I didn't even tend to look. And I turned it was a lady. I gave her the, the plate and she was very appreciative. I just left. Later did I know that she was the executive assistant to the CFO. And I was working with the, within the finance department. And she was the executive assistant to my boss's boss's boss, basically. Very, very powerful power broker she was. So to cut a long story short, you know, she became uh, some kind of an advocate for me. Um, so uh, whenever we, my boss goes to present something to, to, to her boss and then uh, I happen to be part of the presentation team, she would always acknowledge me and, and, and acknowledge, oh, this is Isaac, you know, that kind of thing. And it was, it was cool, right? It was cool. Just think about if I had done something negative to her, what the ripple effect could potentially be. Nobody knows, but to the point that the, the point I'm trying to nail home is that identify power brokers and play your cards well. Put your best foot forward when you are in the presence of power brokers. You can't go wrong on that. Then the next thing, point number two, is that you're going to have to learn very fast. You're going to have to learn super fast. See. Most organizations, most new businesses, no, <clears throat> most um, companies have got their own systems. Some have their own legacy systems that they use um, that when you join, you are expected to hit the ground running. You are expected to learn them and hit the ground running. What you don't want to do is you don't want that after 30 days, you're now going around pointing people, oh, can you show me how to type X? Or can you show me how to sum this? Or can you show me how to print this report? Or how to download this report? That people start looking at you as you're dumb. So the best thing that you do, need to do is that this is your honeymoon period, right? It's a period where people will give you the opportunity to, to, to I mean, a very large tolerance, tolerance level uh, for you to at least show some naivety, right? If people have tolerance for you. If you show some degree of naivety, they know you are new. You don't know the systems. You don't know the people. So they cut you some slack, right? You, you, you cut you slack for you to be you, at least for that time period. Right after that, you cannot do that because everybody else is busy. So what you're going to do is that if they have systems, let's say they have, let's say they're using SAP, or any, or any other uh, systems that they are using, maybe Hyperion, whatever it is, you're going to learn them very quickly. So a case in point, um, I remember the same working with my travel. I joined them as a temp. Um, and after probably hundreds and hundreds of applications that were rejected, I just got a temp job with them. Then... I, once I got in there, I realized that, okay, I knew the theory and things about accounting and finance and things, but the, the practicals, I didn't know nothing. And that's always been a problem for most Africans studying um, in Western Europe and, and, and in the States as well. 
that if you're not very careful, you get all the theory and then the practical, you, you know nothing. So that, that was me. So when I got in, I think, my, you know, when I got in, I, I believe to an extent, you know, I was, I was favored and, and also, uh, you know, I, I put on good attitude, basically. Maybe the good attitude helped to get to secure that position. And um, when I got in, I noticed that, of course, I was the only black person in that department. It's quite a big department at that time. And um, I didn't know nothing about systems, about spread. I think the only thing I knew about spreadsheet was how to do some basic formatting, uh, maybe how to do a sum, that kind of thing. That was all. Not, not much. I couldn't do anything. There I was with young kids, right, who were very proficient in what they did. And me with all my academic qualifications and, you know, no experience. So I was fortunate just to have that job. So I think a week or so later, I got called by one of the superiors who said, hey, um, we need this report by next week, Wednesday. It was, a, I think it's either Tuesday or Wednesday before. So it was like a one week gap. So we said, oh, wow. We said, the lady who has left for maternity, maternity leave that you are covering for. She used to produce this report for us and uh, we need we need you to produce the same thing. I said, wow, okay. I looked at it from the top down. I realized that, wow, I didn't know much about it. It's like complex formulas and com it's like a very comprehensive report. Complex if statements and and for those of you who are very conversant with any form of advanced Excel or advanced Excel proficiency, uh, there were things like lookups, V lookups, and all those things in there. I had I had zero idea what they were. <laughs> so I look at myself. I said, holy cow, how, come, how am I going to do this? So I remember saying, man, I struggled so hard to get this opening. I'm not going to blow it. That very night, I ordered a book on ex, uh, advanced Excel uh, techniques. I've forgotten the, who, who authored the book. And uh, I opted for express delivery. So I got it the very next day after work. For the next four days, I studied like somebody who was about to complete their PhD. I close from work, get home quickly, rush home, probably about 6 p.m., 6.30 at my home, get some dinner, whatever it is, then from 7 to about midnight, sometimes 1 a.m. I'll be studying. Then I would do that, I would do that, um, uh, and, and then on Saturday, the Saturday and the Sunday, Saturday, I spent the whole day from 6 a.m. in the morning till about 2, and I'll maybe take a little bit of rest and then jump back in again from, let's say, 4 to another midnight. So within four days, over the weekend, I finished going through a book that was almost 300 pages with, with a workbook and a, a sign, I mean, and exercise and every, everything. So I had my laptop here. That was the book there. And I really roasted Excel. So by the time it was Monday morning, I was equipped to now face that project. I kid you not. I started it on Monday lunchtime. Worked through it by, by Tuesday morning, I was done. Full report, done. So I, I handed it over to my, my boss and he was surprised because I think I was being set, it was an, in soccer terms, or football, it was probably an offside trap. It really just throw you into the deep end of, of things to see how you survive. Most businesses, unfortunately, can be like that, right? I don't, I'm not saying what the boss did was wrong. That was what they needed. It had to be done. So what you do is that period, that first 30 days is going to be, you have to learn very, very fast, especially the systems that they have. You have to know them inside out, learn very quickly, ask questions, ask people, because that is their best time to ask people questions. Okay. Then the next point is, who are you replacing? Typically, whenever you are enrolled into a new job or even if or it's a business, and you've gotten a new client, typically they probably had a previous uh, person who was fulfilling that service or that product for them. You are, 
you are your how you're going to be accepted is in part going to be dependent on how good that person you are replacing was. Let me put this this way: if the person was amazing, great employee, great, I mean, great in everything, highly skilled team player, very collaborative, productive to the to the max. One of those people who, um, let's say, they are hitting very high marks in their key performance indicators, then you are in. Then you are in for a big surprise. That could spell trouble for you, because you are always going to be ben benchmarked at the person that you are replacing. So if the person was seriously good, then you need to up your game, up your game very quickly. Else, every day they are going to be reminding you of how good that person was. And when they start saying that, that tells how terrible you are. Very soon they may get rid of you. But on the flip side, if the person who you are coming to replace did a lousy job, well, then that's massive advantage. That you will shine very quickly. Light shines in darkness. <laughs> so your light will shine in that darkness very fast. That happened to me several years ago when I was working uh, with Broadlane, Broadlane in Dallas, Texas, in the U.S. So here was I, again, another temporary position. I, I'd moved from New York to Dallas for the first time looking for a job. And then the first one that I found, no, actually, that was the second job. I turned my, the first job down, and, and Broadlane was my first job. So I got it and noticed that this um department that i joined had lost or had some kind of a high attrition rate a high employee turnover and um i also got to know that there was a lady that i was replacing although it was a temporary gig um the lady did a very lousy job that everybody was talking about that oh this lady was terrible she wouldn't submit reports on time she wouldn't do this you wouldn't and if she did it it would be written with errors so for me with i i knew my boss took a gamble on me because for most american companies if you don't have American uh, qualifications, they don't even look at you, especially in the South, right? If you're in the East Coast or probably West Coast, yes, it will cut you some slack, but typically in the Deep South, Texas and things, they want you, your, your qualifications should be American, right? That's, that's, that's the way things are over there. So you, you could see that the hiring manager was really hard pressed for time, and I only got to know when I joined that the gentleman was literally... Uh, 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 having a not not in literal terms, but it's like it's like me metaphor, like somebody pointing a gun on your head and, and standing right by you. That's the level of pressure that he was under to deliver certain deliverables. So he needed people. So when I came in and I could speak the language, he's talking about you know analyzing large swaths of data. I I I I could talk the talk basically because I I had done it many 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 years in Europe. So. He only picked me, I think, because I could talk the talk. <laughs> you know, he was taking a gamble. So I got in there, and um, within three days, they got to know that I was off the charts. I was of a different breed because I had all the skill. I had accumulated all these skills and experiences in my prior work in Europe. So... I got to know that there was a report, very, very Im important report that needed to be generated on a quarterly basis. The report was tied to a certain huge revenue chunk that the company makes. So basically, it went this way, that the company uh, had to prove that they'd saved a certain client a certain amount of money. And if they're able to prove that every quarter, then a company gets a cut or a percentage of the savings they've saved that they are clients. So let's say um, the company says, okay, or my company, uh, let, let, me, let, let me just clarify it for you. So let's say my company works very hard, right? And this was in the healthcare supply chain space. So it worked very hard to save, let's say, a hospital. 
10 million dollars let's say right and of the of the 10 million dollars that they save we say okay give us 10 percent of that saving okay because remember this is a, this is amount of money they would have paid someone anyway they would have expended 10 million dollars but we saved them that 10 million dollars so the company would take a portion of the 10 million dollar savings okay so Every quarter, this little division that I was in was bringing in between two to three million dollars. That's how important it was. And that, that revenue was tied to the work that we had to do to prove that this was the saving. And the, once you do the work, the work has to go through an audit process. When, and after it's audited and proven that, yes, the company saved this amount of money, then the client will wire a check that amount that's how crucial it was so when I went in my boss it used to be done by a group of like four people who would do it being overseen by the boss all of a sudden boss man realizes that he has a high turnover the report is due what does he do he tries to recruit somebody to help out so he is doing it day and night every day and night he's working and it takes probably a month to finish that report Day and night, day and night. So I jump in, he explains the concept of what he's trying to do. I say, oh, well, this, this, this thing is doable. It's, it's not over me. He's like, are you sure you can help? Because he thought I was new. I didn't know much, right? So I jump in real quickly and I, I helped. And I started suggesting things that we could do to even streamline the process to make it shorter. Within two weeks, him, himself and myself, we finished that project. Two weeks, done. What do you think is going to happen? Immediately, the whole department, the whole floor, they got to know that there's a new guy in town who could be very resourceful for this organization. So I, I kind of set, set the tone of how I was going to be perceived for the next couple of years when, uh, that I spent with them, right? I spent a couple of years broadly before being acquired by uh, the comp a competitor. So, so it sets the tone. And that brings me to my next point, that you are going to manage perception. You see, in my previous example, the perception about new employees is that they don't really know what they are doing. Give them time. So if, yes, people are going to give you time, you're going to cut you some slack. But if, if in that formative years, in your honeymoon period, you're able to find an opportunity to demonstrate snippets of who you can be, then that immediately settles in people's mind. It gets baked into their mind that this guy or this lady is good. And you and I know that in our lives, life is all about perception. Life is all about perception. So if you go in and you, you don't deliver the perception is going to be like this. Okay, either they're going to stay a bit indifferent and say, okay, yeah, let's give him or her a little bit of time. But the moment somebody is saying, let's give him or her a little bit of time, know that you're already behind. Know that you are already behind, right? But I would want to be in a situation where it's like, oh, this guy is not even settled in. Look, look at what he's even doing. Look, look at what, even, even though he's not even arrived yet, but look at what he is doing. That tells you that this guy could be a, this guy or this lady could be the real deal. Perception is key. The key point is, the key point about perception is that when you assemble 10 people in a room and you ask them to talk about what they think about you, you may have 10 different opinions. Some of them may think you are terrible. Others may think you are fantastic, a good chunk in the middle, may, may think, Different, different shades of gray, right? What you want to do in managing your perception is that you want to control the narrative of people's perceptions about you so that that narrative becomes almost something like a common thread. Let me, let me put it this way. You want the overarching perception that people have about you be something that you, what you did controlled that or what you did generated that perception right so 
Uh, and I'll give an example. There are people that no matter what you do, they won't like you. You and I know that, right? There are people too that no matter what they do, you like them. Even though you don't even know their name. The moment you see them, you like them. That's how the world is. I'll say that's how God has created the world. Some people you like, some people you don't like. There's nothing wrong about that. But for most people, they are going to be rational with you. That what you're going to be doing is going to, be, is going to determine how they perceive you. So, if you begin to assert yourself and do a great job, the general consensus about you is that this lady is good. This gentleman is good. This gentleman is a team player. This gentleman is productive. This gentleman is hardworking. These are, so, your action is actually feeding that narrative. And that narrative is what is feeding the perception they have about you. So, how do you do that? You do that by adequate preparation for every task that you are given, regardless of how skillful or, or how knowledgeable you are in the organization. That is why my first point is very, very valid. That you need, to, I mean, second point, you need to learn very, very fast. So any task that you are given, put some thought into it. Do it to the best of your ability. If it's a meeting that you go, prepare so well. Ask questions, ask a ton of questions with your colleagues, sometimes your boss, so that you are not going there as a as a somebody who can't speak or as a you know some, somebody who who has a problem with their cognitive function. You're not gonna go there like that. You're gonna go there somebody who's although you you are not supposed to know, yet you know. If you are not supposed to know and yet you know, that places you in a great boat when it comes to it employee or, or perception of other people around you. It's super critical. Manage that perception. Within that 30-day window, manage their perception. Don't let your perception be managed by other people. Don't let, don't let your little errors here and there, your lack of excellence in delivering things, don't let you. Let's say you, they give you a job. They know you are you're a new person, right? They know it. And your boss gives you maybe put together these slides for me. Slide presentation is nothing. There's no, I mean, slide design is nothing. It's, it's nothing. Anybody can do it. They give it to you because they know you're, you're new. So they give you some of the mundane stuff just to, you know, get you going first. Then you do it, simple thing like that, then it's riddled with grammatical errors, spelling mistakes and things like that. You can't do that, right? So that, a task like that, do it so well. Now, although it's small, when you present it, now people begin, wow, this guy hasn't even arrived yet. Or this lady hasn't even started. And look at what they are doing. Excellent. That means that if we put enough resources into them, if we invest resources into this person, this person could be an asset for our organization. And that is what I mean by managing, um, managing perception. Then finally, finally, very important point. Is you're going to have to cultivate or develop a virtue called likability. You're going to be likable. In this world, people flow with people they like. It's not people who do well. It's people they like. When people like you and they flow with you, they are likely to flow very well with you. And when they flow very well with you, that's when, when you ask them questions, you don't become an irritant. Because they like you, even before you ask the question, they are answering. When they hate you, when you haven't even asked the question, <laughs> they are annoyed with you, right? <laughs> That's the irony of life. So you got to be likable. How, how, how do you become likable? Put on a smile. Man, look people in the eye. You know, say hello to people. Don't just pass people around. When you are new, don't just pass people. Be likable. Show, show that you are approachable. Right, and then the next thing that you need to do is that you need to find common ground. Common ground with people. When you are communicating with people, when you're in conversation with your friends, your colleagues, your higher ups, you're always looking for the first two minutes, first three minutes, in any conversation. Is it possible that this person I'm talking to, I can establish some kind of a common ground with that person? And that's what I mean by that. Common ground is. And I'll use an example to show that I had, um, when, when I worked broadly, we had the, 
um, one of our C-level executives, very, very powerful man at that time. His name was Greg Erickson. I think he used to work for Press Ghani in, in Chicago after he left uh, Broadly. Greg, if you are watching this, I'm giving you a shout out because you, you, you made an indelible imprint in my mind and in my heart about establishing common ground with people. Greg was fantastic because regardless of who you are, you can be the cleaner. He was the CIO, Chief Information Officer, Chief Operating Officer. But regardless of who you are, Greg would meet you and come to your level or find something in common with you. And that will stay with you for the rest of your life. That's why I still remember him till today. Right. So I remember me having a conversation with him one day. Just, you know, within two minutes, he found a common ground with me. This is how he did it. We were talking. Obviously, he knew I, I, I had a, a foreign accent. So he found out, hey, where, where are you from? Uh, you know, born and raised in Ghana. Uh, you know, he got to know that I spent a good deal of time in Europe. I mean, in, in UK. So I said, oh, wow. So, wow. So you're from Ghana, you schooled in UK, and uh, you worked in UK. Wow, that's exciting. So, uh, what, you know, do, do you follow um, football or soccer? I mean, he says soccer, but <clears throat> soccer means European uh, rest, of, <clears throat> rest of the world football. So I said, yeah, 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 I, I do. I said, you know, so he just, yeah, which team do you support? You know, at that time, it was all these, uh, you know, we, from Ghana to the Michael Asian, you know, being with Chelsea, 99% of Ghanaians went to support Chelsea at that time. So, uh, you know, for, for those of you crazy soccer fans, right? I, I'm a crazy soccer fan. I like soccer to an extent, but I'm not a diehard fan. You know, you know, soccer guy. I, I like to watch when I when I want to, but I'm not really, really too much into it. Uh, so I would say I'm a loose Chelsea supporter just because of my Galician in those days. So I just said, oh yeah, Chelsea. He said, wow, oh wow, that's 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 interesting. And um, at that time, Chelsea had a player from Ukraine, and um, his name was Andriy Shevchenko. If you rem rem remember him, he was one of the top players in, from Ukraine, and he said, you know, yeah, we, my wife also likes um, Chelsea. I said, oh, really? He said, yes, my wife is from Ukraine. And, uh, and, and, and we go to Ukraine all the time. And Ukraine, soccer is the big, biggest thing there. So my wife is crazy about it. She watches Chelsea all the time. She's just da 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 da, da right? So just picture it. This is big guy, big time person, you know what I mean? Um, he's next to the CEO, basically. With a very big organization who is talking to somebody who is way beneath him and yet being able to establish a common ground. Right. So when you meet people, organization, try. Sometimes it could be that your children go to, you and your colleagues' children go to the same school. It could be uh, your parents may even be in the same church or same singing group or uh, you may be old students association, you know, linked. You went to this school, you went to that school. You may not be the same year that you finished, but you may be in the same school. Try to find those kind of things and see if you have common ground with people. Because the moment you do that, it increases your likability quotient remarkably. And I believe that if you follow these five steps, your first 30 days in any endeavor is going to be sweet. I want you to subscribe to this channel. This, this Subscribe to this channel. It's a great channel. And once you do, anytime I publish content like this, you are going to be alerted that you can watch and enjoy. And not only that, this video over here that I've done in the past that I believe is going to be of a huge resource to you. So watch my videos and it's going to help you big time. All right. Thank you and have a great time. Bye-bye.